before I begin, I want to share a funny story that has always been one of my favorites around this time. And if you've heard it before, I apologize. Uh, Jim, not this Jim, but another Jim. Jim was leaving church after Christmas uh, services when the pastor greeted him and said, Jim, it's time you join the army of the Lord. We need to see you every Sunday. I'm already in the army of the Lord, Pastor, Jim replied. Then why do I only see you on Christmas and Easter? Jim looked right. Look, Jim looked to his right and to his left and, lean, and then leaned over to whisper, I'm in the Secret Service. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, in that story, you know, I, when I hear that story, and think of, I think about those that only come during Christmas and Easter for, you know, church services. And, and uh, but yeah, it's maybe a story you can share with others. I've always liked it. Um, but this morning, we're going to be looking at a beautiful, precious gift that God has given us inside of a manger over 2,000 years ago. We're going to examine how and why he presented this gift. The choice we have of receiving or accepting his gift and the importance of unwrapping this gift or his gift. You guys, I'm sure you guys have a memory, whether you were young or older and you've thought to yourself, man, you've received a gift on Christmas. You're like thinking to yourself, man, this is the best gift I've ever gotten. I know I have. There's been some pretty special gifts. Um, and you just get all giddy. You know, when you get it, you're like, yeah. Well, I hope that today, this morning, this morning's message will show you that God has indeed given us the best gift ever, his son, Jesus Christ. So before we get into God's word, and we're going to be in Luke chapter 2, before we get into God's word, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us. Lord God, uh, we are thankful that you brought us all here, that we're safe and sound, Lord. Um, even though some of us have been, have had a really difficult week, um, challenging week, uh, you've, your goodness and your mercy and your grace has brought us here, Lord, for a specific reason and purpose. Regardless of how we felt or, you know, we're here now and we know that you're going to, you have a word for us, for every single person. So I pray that all distractions may be removed, Lord, um, that right now we just focus in, on you as we sit at your feet. Soften everyone's hearts and minds to be able to receive your word. We desperately want to hear from you. We know that your words bring life. They, they are the words of life. So fill this room with your spirit, Lord. We look forward to what you have to say. We pray these things in Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. So I want to begin this morning by reading to you the presentation of God's gift, and we are going to be going through a couple of different passages, and uh, we're going to, the presentation of God's gift is found in Luke chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles with you, um, I'm going to turn there, Luke chapter 2, verse 1. The Word of God says, in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole empire should be registered. This first registration took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So everyone went to be registered, each to his own town. Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house 
and family line of David to be registered along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was pregnant. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth. Then she gave birth to her firstborn, her firstborn son, and she wrapped him tightly in cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. In the same region, shepherds were staying out in the fields and keeping watch at night over their flock. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the city of David, a Savior was born for you, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped tightly in cloth and laying in a manger. Suddenly there was a multitude of the heavenly, go of the heavenly host with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest of heaven, and peace on earth to people he favors. When the angels had left them and returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go straight to Bethlehem and see what has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. They hurried off and found both Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. After seeing them, they reported the message they were told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed, were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. I'll stop there. Sometimes Christmas gifts are real surprises. Maybe you've had a similar experience uh, as a kid, as this, the kid in this story. And he tells this story. When I was a kid, I wanted a basketball so bad I could scream. I dropped all kinds of hints. I made false phone calls to my mother in another voice, telling her that her son really ought to have a basketball. I found the cheapest prices. I dropped those on the breakfast table. You know, all those things. And finally, there appeared under the Christmas tree a box. Look, just the size of a basketball. Whew. I could just feel myself making shots with it. Christmas Day came. I tore into that thing, and it was a world globe. Have you ever tried to dribble a world globe? I mean, you can't even inflate the dumb thing. Unbelievable surprise. Don't look. Didn't look at all what I expected. You see, in a sense, the world was waiting to get a basketball, but instead it received something that didn't look like what they expected. Rather than presenting Jesus to the world in fanfare, surrounded in wealth and royalty, God presented his own son, surrounded by animals and a few shepherds. In the story that we just read, we see that the story of God's greatest gift to mankind. Yet it was a gift that no one but a few people expected. And that gift was none other than his only begotten son, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. In the first three verses of John's Gospel, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through Him, and apart from Him, not one thing was created, not one thing was, was created that has been created. Now think about that verse for a minute. Who was with God? He who was with God before the world was even created was now that tiny 
little baby wrapped tightly in cloth laying in a manger. Here's how Augustine put it. He was created of a mother whom he created. He was carried by hands that he formed. He cried in the manger in a wordless, wordless infancy. He is he, the word, without whom all human eloquence is mute. What I personally find completely mesmerizing was that this is how God chose to present the greatest gift ever. When I look at everything he created and I see the beauty in it, it blows me away knowing that in God's mind, an infant laying in a manger, wrapped in rags, was his idea of a simple and yet beautifully wrapped gift. A gift to me and a gift to you. For example, every time I've seen, and I mentioned this story last week, every time I see my wife wrapping presents, I can't help but to admire, again, I just look and admire, as she raps, how methodical and patiently she does it. She, she chooses the right paper. She uses the right, right bow or how she even wraps the presents with the string. I mean, it's really interesting. It's really, again, mesmerizing. And then again, picks the right ribbon, how she picks the right ribbon to match the gift. Me, I... I don't have a gift for that. I, I can't do that. I'm not as patient or as creative as she is. If it were up to me, anything I would wrap would be just simple. It would be a simple, it would be small, it would be a square, and it probably would be wrapped in a newspaper. And with a post-it with someone's name on it. I have a lot of post-its at home. Um, and yeah, I've written in my chicken scratch, but again, she's very careful, very methodical. She's really good with that. Well, when I read how Jesus was born, I see a perfect combination of both beauty and simplicity, and only God could have planned it that way. J.I. Packer said this, the Almighty appeared on earth as a helpless human baby, needing to be fed and changed and taught to, taught to talk like any other child. The more you think about it, the more staggering it gets. Nothing in fiction is so fantastic as this truth of the incarnation. So now let me ask you all, what do you think would have happened if God had chosen to withhold his son from us and Jesus hadn't been born, I could stand here and give you a hundred million things that could have happened, but for the sake of time, I'll only narrow it down to five things that would have occurred. First of all, we'd still be waiting on a savior. Secondly, the Old Testament prophets would have been proven wrong. Thirdly, we wouldn't know at all what God was like. Fourthly, we wouldn't have an example to follow. And fifthly, we'd still be dead in our sins. Now keep these five in mind as I will be mentioning or referring back to them in a bit. Now, if you consider these five things I mentioned, what do you think the state of humanity would be without the birth of Jesus? You think the world would be better off? 
Yes, I know many atrocities have been committed in the name of religion. Yes, I know that some people believe we'd be better off if there were no religion, as John Lennon famously sang. No religion or God. He, John Lennon, and others believe we all would be better off just trying to be good people, trying to do good things. They believe that we humans can be selfless, so selfless that we'd be willing to give our lives for the betterment of humanity. Doesn't it all sound like a utopian type society if everyone was like that? But the truth is, maybe you see this as well, I don't see the world getting any better. In fact, when I look around, when I watch the news, when I see what's going on in different places, just in this country and other countries, we see that the world is slowly falling apart. It seems like every week there are news reports of some kind of active shooter or some kind of violent protest or a war or, you know, crazy stuff going on. But yeah, this, and again, these, some, of these cra some of these crazy news stories, read and hear about it just here in uh, America alone, but man, you know, I'm sure you've heard about the other, some other, you know, things happening, uh, violence happening around the world. But again, here in America, we see news reports of op op opioid addiction and how it's wrecking, wrecking havoc on our youth and how families are just being destroyed because of pride and selfishness. And so this only goes to show that instinctually, humans are sinful. And unless sin is removed from mankind, any talk of a utopian society, it's all just fantasy. It'll never come to be. It'll, it'll, never, it'll never happen. As it says in Romans chapter 3, verse 10, there is no one who does what is good, not even one. And in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But my friends, thanks be to God that Jesus was in fact born. And as a result, there's now hope for humanity. Quoting J.I. Packer again, he said, the Christmas message is that there's hope for a ruined humanity, hope of pardon, hope of peace with God, hope of glory, because at the Father's will, Jesus became poor and was born in a stable so that 30 years later, he might hang on a cross. Earlier, I stated, I shared with you five things that would have happened if Jesus hadn't been born. I now want to tell you five things that did happen when he was born. First of all, we no longer have to look or wait for a savior, because Jesus is that savior. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, it says, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. False prophets and so-called saviors of mankind, they've come, but they're all dead. They're all gone. 
Some have been forgotten. But they've all died. Yet, only one has stood the test of time. And guess what? He's still alive. Because he defeated death when he rose from the dead. Spurgeon wrote, infinite and an infant, eternal and yet born of a woman, almighty and yet hanging on a woman's breast, supporting a universe and yet needing to be carried in a mother's arms, king of angels and yet the reputed son of Joseph, heir of all things and yet the carpenter's despised son. And again, I'll elaborate a little more on that in a bit. Secondly, the second thing that did happen when he was born we're now able to read and trust the words spoken to us about Jesus in the Old Testament. Some Bible scholars suggest that there are over 300 prophetic scriptures completed in the life of Jesus. Circumstances such as his birthplace, his lineage, and method of execution were beyond his control and couldn't have been accidentally or deliberately fulfilled. In the book, Science Speaks, Peter Stoner and Robert Newman dis discuss the statistical improbability of one man, whether accidentally or deliberately, fulfilling just eight of the prophecies Jesus fulfilled. The chance of this happening, they say, is 1 in 10th to the 17th power. It's a lot of zeros. Stoner gives an illustration that helps visualize the magnitude of such odds. Suppose we take 10 to the 17th power silver dollars and lay them on the face of Texas. They will cover, they will cover the state two feet deep. Now mark one of those silver dollars and stir the whole mass thoroughly all over the state. Blindfold, blindfold a man and tell him that he can travel as far as he wishes, but he must pick up one silver dollar and say, and say this is the right one. What chance would he have of getting the right one? Just the same chance the prophets would have had of writing these eight prophecies and having them all come true in any one man from their day from their day to the present time providing they wrote using providing they wrote using their own wisdom the mathematical improbability of 300 or 44 or even just eight fulfilled prophecies of Jesus stands as evidence of his messiahship Thirdly, because, because of his birth, we're now able to know God, what God is like, when we read about him. We're able to know what God is like when, uh, uh, when we read about all what Jesus, what Jesus did in the New Testament. Again, let me explain. When I began this message, I referenced John chapter 1, verses one through three. And the first two verses it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Well, if you read a little further to verse 14, you'll run into another amazing verse that says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Later, Paul also wrote in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, For the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ. Let me read that verse again. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, For the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ. 
So what these verses tell us is that the eternal second person of the Trinity took upon himself a human nature similar to ours. Yet he was distinct from us in that he still maintained his divine nature. In other words, Jesus was 100% man and also 100% God. R.C. Sproul described Jesus' incarnation like this. When Jesus came to this earth, he laid aside his divine attributes of omniscience, omnipotence, and all the rest. He doesn't communicate them to the human side. He doesn't deify the human nature. But in the mystery of the union between the divine and the human nature of Jesus, the human nature is truly human. It's not omniscient. It's not omnipotent. It's none of those things. But at the same time, the divine nature remains fully and completely divine. Sproul goes on to say, but in any case, what is emptied is glory, privilege, exaltation. Jesus, in the incarnation, makes himself of no reputation he allows his own divine exalted he allows his own divine exalted standing to be subject to human hostility and human criticism and denial so if you want to know what god is like all you have to do is look at jesus listen to what jesus said in John chapter 14 verses 7 and 9 he said this if you know me you will also know my father the one who has seen me has seen the father now can't see Jesus like the apostles did but you can't know him all of you can know him. And if you, the more you get to know him, the more you fall in love with him, the more you just, again, you understand, yes, that's what God the Father is like. And it's, again, it just starts to blow your mind away. Amazing. Amazing. Fourthly, because Jesus was born, we now have a perfect example to follow. You can literally take any situation or circumstance in life and see how Jesus exemplified it in his own life. He knew what it was like to be hungry, thirsty, to be in need, and to have plenty. He knew sadness and happiness, anger and joy. He knew what it was like to be accepted and rejected, loved and hated. He showed us how to live and how to die. More importantly, through, though, in Christ, we have a perfect example of how to love. In John 13, 34, Jesus said, Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. Let me also read to you a passage you're probably uh, more familiar with that exactly personifies the love Jesus had and wanted us to have. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8, it says, Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy, is not boastful, is not arrogant, is not rude, is not self-seeking, is not irritable, and does not keep record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures 
all things. Love never ends. Fifthly and finally, because of that little baby that was born, we're given a savior to rescue us from sin and death. Prior to the birth of Jesus, an angel told Joseph in a dream, she will give birth to a son and you're to name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Do you get that? Did you get that? This angel informed Joseph of a fact, told him what to do with that fact, and explained the reason why. He will save his people from their sin. So who are his people? They're Christian believers who the Father gave to Jesus and those who do his will. When, he said, when it says that he will save them from their sins, the meaning is twofold. First, he saves or delivers them from the penalty of their sins, which is eternal punishment in hell. This happens instantaneously at the moment a sinner places their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and is born again. And secondly, he saves them from the power of sin in their daily lives. This happens gradually and progressively as the believer learns to walk in dependence, in, depend, in dependence, two words, to walk in dependence on the Holy Spirit. Let me share another familiar yet important verse that explains why the Father sent His Son says this in John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. For God loved the world in this way. He gave His only, one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. So you see, God sent his son to free us from the bondage of sin and death, to forgive us of our sins, and more importantly, to give us eternal life. So I hope that by now it's abundantly clear how significant the birth of Jesus Christ is. It should really make you want to shout, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Listen to what a famous musician once said. The idea that there's a force of love and logic behind the universe is overwhelming to start with, if you believe it. Actually, maybe even far-fetched to start with, but the idea that the idea that that same love and logic would choose to describe itself as a baby born in straw and poverty is genius. And it brings me to my knees, literally. To me, as a poet, I'm just in awe of that. It makes some sort of it makes some sort of poetic sense. It's the thing that makes me a believer though it didn't dawn on me for many years. Again, it just blew him away. Well, now that God has presented his gift, now he's waiting to see who's willing to accept it. My question to you is, have you received it? Let's look at a passage that, well, in a minute we'll be looking at a passage that where it shows us how he presented his gift. But first, let me tell you this. An American Express survey about Christmas gifts found that the fruitcake was chosen most often, 31%, from a list of worst holiday gifts. 
I've never gotten a fruitcake. I don't know what that is. So I don't know if you have or not. And you tell me later on if you think that's the worst gift you've ever gotten. Uh, but uh, please, if you thought it was bad, don't give it to me. I, I, although I never had it, you know. <laughs> don't 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 give me a, a fruitcake. Um, I'll take any any other kind of cake. <coughs> I like cheesecake. <laughs> well, it says it even finished ahead of no gift at all. When asked how to dispose of a bad gift, 30% would hide it in the closet. 21% would return it. And 19% would just re-gift it, would give it away. This suggests that the Christmas fruitcake might get recycled as a gift for the host of the New Year's party. This survey proves not everyone will like or accept a gift that they've received. Well, the next passage we're going to be reading also proves it. So again, if you have your Bibles open, um, I'm going to be going to the, the Gospel of John. I'll be in the first chapter again. The Gospel of John. John chapter 1. I'm going to be reading from verses 10 to 13. He was in the world, and the world was created through him, and yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of natural descent, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. It's astonishing to me that after reading all that God had, what all that God had done for the nation of Israel, they refused to receive God's precious gift of His Son as their Messiah. But the Bible has also taught me that, a, that someone's or a people's unwanted gift is another people's joy and treasure. So again, let me ask you, what will you do with the gift God has given you? Will you thank Him, toss it to the side, and choose the gifts the world has to offer? So, let me tell you, let me tell you, you'll never find true joy and satisfaction from the gifts that come from the world. Eventually, you will get bored, and you will just move on to the next one. King Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes 1 through 1, chapter 1, verse 14, I have seen all the things that are done under the sun, and I have found everything to be futile, a pursuit of the wind. I read a story that said, one year when Christmas Day fell on a Sunday, a farmer decided to go to church. Like some people, he thought he was fulfilling his religious obligation by going to church twice a year, at Christmas and at Easter. The sermon that day was, that was preached, uh, the sermon that day was preached from Isaiah chapter 1 verse 3. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's feeding trough. But Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Isaiah was saying there that a man is dumber, was saying that, a, that man is dumber than the animals. Well, after church, the farmer returned home and stood among his cows. One of them began to lick his hand a practical demonstration of the sermon he had just heard. Strong man though he was, the farmer began to weep as he thought, God did so much for me, and yet I never thanked him. My cow is far more grateful than I am. What do I ever give her, the cow, other than grass and water? See, this man, he finally got it. 
finally clicked for him. He realized the personal significance of Jesus' birth and how ungrateful he was. How ungrateful he was to the God, for to God, for the God um, that had given him, that had given him, uh, had given Jesus. Now, on the other hand, have you accepted the gift of his son with joy and thankfulness? If you haven't, don't let another Christmas season go by without doing so. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 13, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame. Since there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, because the same Lord of all richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Let me repeat that last verse there. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Later on, I will give you, those watching, an opportunity to accept Christ, to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. God raised him from the dead. I will give you an opportunity to do that. But let me just finish this last part of our message today, and that's unwrapping, the unwrapping of God's gift. Again, so now that you've received the gift of Jesus, the only thing left to do is to unwrap the gift and make him yours and rejoice. So we're going to, I'm going to, I'll share it with you. I, you don't have to go there, but I'm going to be going to reading from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 8 through 9. Now, before I read there, before I read that, do you remember unwrapping that one special gift that mom or dad told you to open up last? What did you do? And how did you feel when you finally opened it? Did you play with that thing or held that thing, whatever it was, the entire day? Well, this is how God wants you to feel about his gift to you. Regardless if you're a new or older believer. It says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though not seeing him now, you believe in him, and you rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And also in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, through nine, eight and 9, for you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it's, a, it's God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. What good is a gift if you don't unwrap it and make it yours? I shared in the beginning how I find it mesmerizing when I see Robin wrapping these gifts. I wish you could see it. You know, I really do. I wish you could see some of the gifts and how she, how she does it. But imagine her handing you one of these beautifully wrapped gifts with something precious inside of it. And you just decide, no, I'm not going to, I'm just going to toss it to the side. That alone is, you know, it, it's crazy, but just unwrapping it, not even wanting to unwrap it. Something else. 
God sent his son for you to love and cherish so that you may have joy and hope, not just during the holidays here, but every single day of your life. And the best way to do that is by trusting him, reading, studying his word, spending time with him in prayer, and being in fellowship with other believers. <coughs> I'll end with a quote from John R. Rice. You can never truly enjoy Christmas until you can look up into the Father's face and tell him you've received his Christmas gift. Church, the best gift ever. You've been given the best gift ever. You've been given the best gift ever. That gift was given to us in a manger over 2,000 years ago. If you're here or you're watching and listening to this online, and you're ready to receive that gift and unwrap it, I want to lead you in a prayer to do that. I want to invite you to come to the cross just lay your, all your sins there at the foot of the cross. Guess what? If you confess Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Our Savior was born or 2,000 years ago in a manger. And over 30 years later, he died on a cross to forgive you of your sins. All of them, past, present, and future. Regardless of what you've done, no matter how bad it was, no matter how bad your addictions were, no matter how bad your vices were, no matter how bad you think you've blown it, God will forgive you. You will receive that forgiveness if you just believe and trust in him. And once you surrender your life to Jesus, Holy Spirit will make his home in you. You will be born again. So, if you're ready for that, wherever you're at, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head. With all sincerity, with all your heart, Pray this. Jesus, I'm sorry. I admit that I'm a sinner. That I've blown it. And so now I ask you to please forgive me. I now truly believe that you died on the cross for my sins. And I confess you were raised from the dead. I repent of my sins, Lord. I turn away from them. And 
And I now trust you to be my Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. So now, Lord, I ask you, fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born-again life. I pray this in your name. Amen. If you, if you prayed that, please reach out to us. We want to hear from you. We want to, we want to hear from you. We want to hear your story. We, you know, we want to know how you came about hearing this message. And um, if you're able to, like I said, please share it. Someone else may hear it. I know, again, these are Christmas-themed, related messages, but we're in, as I said in the beginning, we're in that season, and, you know, a lot of people are thinking about a lot of things during this time, and one of the greatest gifts you could possibly give them right now, give him or her, is maybe this message that will lead them to the cross. So share it. Um, you won't get any copyright strikes from me at all. Um, so, uh, yeah, reach out to us. If you're here locally, we want to invite you to come check us out. There's no obligation here um, to stay or, you know, but we want to invite you just to come check us out. Uh, I believe that you will be blessed, and, that you, and I do think that you'll, you know, uh, learn a lot while you're here. Uh, thank you for joining us this week. Thank you for being with us. Um, I hope that... Those of you watching, have a great day, have a great week, and that, uh, yeah, no, we love you, and we'll see you again next week. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.